Thank you. Uh, Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Now, we uh, last few weeks, we've been talking about the three questions uh, that were asked Jesus here in Luke chapter 20. Uh, this week, uh, we're going to talk about the parable that Jesus told them right here in the middle of the those three questions. <clears throat> now, this parable... Uh, I guess this message would be more for those that uh, are unsaved, that may reject Christ. But this message can also be towards uh, those that uh, don't serve Christ. Uh, it's one thing to accept Jesus as your Savior. It's another thing to make Him Lord over your life. And we as Christians, we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, but we have to make Christ Lord over us. We have to live for Him. We have to serve Him. Everything we do, everything we, we say, if we call ourselves Christians, represents Jesus. So that, that kind of puts a burden on us, if, if you use that word correctly, um, that as we go out into the world, we got to remember that we represent Christ. Uh, and uh, this is kind of a warning here. Um, that Christ has given to those who reject Him, to those who uh, reject God, to those who do not live for, for the Lord. Uh, and, and at one point, He talks about that uh, uh, the, the, the Lord of the land will, will, send, will kill the husbandry. We'll, we'll read that here in a second. And uh, we as Christians, if we're not careful, if we're not living for God, if we're not uh, producing fruit for Him, eventually He will take us out. We will have a premature death uh, because we're not living for Him, because uh, we're not serving Him, we're not ob obediently uh, living for Christ. Yes. And there have been Christians, good people, that have been taken out of the world uh, prematurely because of their lack of obedience. And I think that's partly of what Christ is talking about here also. Uh, but He gives us a warning. Now, anybody ever went to the store or bought something and read, uh, those uh, warning labels on, on, on the items you, uh, you buy. Well, I wrote down here a handful. Uh, window air conditioning units are now required to display this warning. Caution. Avoid dropping air conditioner out of window. <laughs> All right? I think that's kind of silly. The tag on irons say, you know, clothing irons. Warning. Never iron clothes while wearing them. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay, hold on, hold on. A warning label on a Halloween Superman costume reads, Warning, Kate does not enable user to fly. <laughs> Some people probably would have needed that when they jumped off of Lord Bottide High School. <clears throat> I'll try it once. At least once. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nabisco Easy Spread Cheese announces on its label, for best results, remove cap. <clears throat> the label on Little One's Baby Lotion reads, keep a product away from children. Take that. All right. A warning label is designed to protect us from harm. If there is a warning label attached to this passage of Scripture, it would read, warning, if you reject God's Son, you will receive God's judgment. Uh, on the Sunday before the crucifixion, Jesus was welcomed by the cheers of the people, and as He entered Jerusalem, He paused and sobbed bitter tears over how the people of Israel had rejected Him. Over the next few days, He taught openly in the temple courts, and we talked about that, how He went in and cleansed and cleaned, uh, cleaned out the, the, the court or the temple, uh, and then he was teaching and he was preaching and, and different uh, sects of, of the Jewish religion uh, came in and, and questioned him. And remember last week we talked and said that they questioned the third time and they no longer questioned Jesus. Uh, the religious leaders tried unsuccessful, unsuccess, unsuccessfully to entrap him with trick questions. In the midst of these questions, uh, here's the parable uh, that contained a scathing indictment against the failure of the Jewish people to accept Him. And this is also for us ourselves. We reject Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior. It has to be both. 
It can't be just Savior. Yes, Lord, Jesus saved me, but I'm going to live how I want to. Uh, it doesn't give us a right to sin. It doesn't give us a free pass. After we accept His salvation, then we have to live for Him. Now, if you're in Luke chapter 20, verse 9, say amen. amen. Luke chapter 20, and verse 9, Jesus speaking here, then began He to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and let it, uh, let it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a servant to the husband, husbandman that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And, be, and he beheld them and said, What is it then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, as we calm our minds and our hearts, as we begin to meditate on your word on this passage that we just read, we think about our own lives and we think about that specific time in our life that we ask Jesus to become our Lord and Savior. <coughs> Father, as we go through this passage and this message today, I ask that you will just help us to think about the times that we have rejected Christ as our Lord. He is our Savior because we have accepted your salvation, but many times we have rejected Christ as our Lord, making our own decisions to please ourselves, not taking a few moments to ask you what you would prefer at this point in time, how you would prefer us to act or to live or what to do so as to please you and to bring honor and glory to you, Father. I do ask that, Lord, that you will help us as Christians, those of us that are Christians, to make Jesus Lord of our lives, to not reject Him, to not push the Holy Spirit away to not grieve your Holy Spirit. Father, I do ask that you will just use my tongue as this ready writer to write on the hearts of your people. Lord, as uh, James McMenus says all the time, I hear him say, so that we as Christians are reminded that Satan is defeated, we are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the title of this message is The Shocking Truth About God. When Jesus finished telling the, uh, this parable, the people were so shocked, they cried out, may it never be so. May it never be that they reject the heir to the, uh, to the Lord and that He come and destroy them. And we know that uh, they did reject the heir. They did reject Christ. Yes. They killed Him. Uh, Satan, you were talking about this morning, Mike. Satan... Uh, uh, thinks that if he can kill the Jews or if he can ruin the Jews, if he can wipe them off the face of the earth, then the Lord will just wash his hands of mankind and, and Satan will have won. Satan even tried to win by killing Christ, the Son of God, uh, not realizing that God was going to raise him up from the dead that third day. All Satan did was do the work and the will of God. Praise the Lord. Uh, God can use even Satan to do his will. Um, 
But these people were astonished because Jesus disrupted their nice, neat understanding of the God of Israel. Their view of God had become so skewed they thought God existed for the sake of Israel, not Israel for God. We are here for God. We have been made for His pleasure and His alone. That is the reason that we are created. We are here to serve Him. We are here to spread the gospel of Christ. We are here to proclaim the name of Jesus and to spread the gospel so that the world might be saved. Otherwise, uh, if we didn't have a reason to be here, when we got saved, God would have taken us on home. Or if we rejected Christ, He would just wipe us completely off the face of the earth. Over 90% of Americans claim to believe in God. But what kind of God do they trust? For some, He is this nice, neat God. They salute for an hour a week and then they live the rest of their lives as if He doesn't even exist. For others, their religious rules and rituals have become a substitute for knowing God. Jesus Christ visited planet Earth 2,000 years ago to teach what God is really like. In this parable, He reveals four fundamental aspects of the nature of God. And we're going to, I'm going to try to remember one, two, three, and four. Okay? Number one, God is good. Should have got an amen right there. Amen. Okay, well, let's try it one more time. God is good. Amen. All the time. All the time. All the time. God, God is good. good. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He has placed us in this world to tend it. To tend it. Like the owner of the vineyard, God created this world. He is the owner. owner all right, I'm going to get this right. He is the owner of this vineyard called planet Earth. He has placed us here to manage, manage it. You know, my mouth is not working today, guys. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, he has placed us here to manage it. We don't own anything. We're just tenants here. We're just borrowing it for a little while. The psalmist proclaimed, <clears throat> Psalm 24 and verse 1, the earth is of the Lord's and the fullness thereof. A good place to learn about the nature of God is in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, chapter 1. All right, we're going to go through all of Genesis this morning before we leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Took us, what, a year? Not even done yet. Mm. Okay, what, three years, I think it was, on our Sunday night class. Uh, the first three words in the Hebrew Bible are Bereshit bara Elohim aleta, which means, in the beginning, God created. Aleta, or with God. Amen. The Bible really doesn't go into detail about how God created the universe. It simply says, in the beginning, God created. Jesus, God spoke. Jesus made it happen. The Holy Spirit made it come alive. Yes. Okay. Other than that, that's about all we know. We don't know is if God, as He was speaking, is if it was happening, or if God said to Jesus, His Son said let there be light, and then Jesus makes light. We, we don't know these things, but it doesn't matter. What we know is that God is the owner of this planet, owner of this vineyard, owner. He, it is His. It is not ours. We as, we as humankind, mankind, uh, we think that, that we own everything, and that we can just do with it what we want. And it's so sad because we think we... We, we, we make things happen. We're, it's, it's our fault that we have... Uh, 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 what is this that's going on? Man, my mind just went blank right then and there. Uh, this uh, uh, heat wave, yeah. Uh, global warming, thank you very much. Uh, we think it's our fault that, that, that we have this global warming. We think it's our fault that, uh, uh, that we're running out of uh, uh, pure, clean oxygen, pure, clean water. Uh, we think it's our no. God said, "Let there be light. Let there be uh, the the trees there. Let there be animals. Let there be man." But He had a reasoning behind it because once sin entered into the world, death became came upon this world, and then that means that that this world only has a certain amount of life in it because of how death has touched. This world. It's not because of me. It's not because of you. It's because of sin itself. But God sent His Son to die on the cross so that all mankind might be lived. And through Jesus, everything is made new. Through Christ, God makes all things new. When, when 
when we go through the millennial reign and, and Christ wipes off uh, sin and death completely all, off and, and it's completely gone and sin and death and everything goes into the uh, lake of fire, then He's going to make all things new. Now, there's different um, beliefs on, on what the uh, New Jerusalem is going to look like, uh, but I, I believe this earth will be made brand spanking new Amen. like it was supposed to be at the very beginning when God Amen. first created it, and it will stay like that for eternity and eternity uh, on end. I believe that God created the heavens and earth. And you don't have to commit to intellectual suicide <clears throat> to believe there is a higher being who planned and created this world. Uh, just look at clocks. You don't look at the clock and say, wow, when did that jump out of the palm? <laughs> uh, no, a maker, a clock maker made that. Okay, uh, There are people that truly believe that we come from pond scum. Mm -hmm. I think some people are still there, but uh, <laughs> anyway, that's a whole other another story. But no, God created us out of His own image. It wasn't just this little slime that that that, whoop, that uh, lightning hit and it got a brain and crawled out of the water and then jumped up and said, okay, here I am. No, God said, we're going to create man out of our own image Amen. and we're going to create woman from man's womb. Uh, he created something, stepped back, and God said that it is good. Genesis chapter 1, the phrase, and God saw that it was good is repeated six times. When he finished, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Everything that God... He didn't say, okay, we're going to wait for this scum, this stuff on the bottom to kind of generate up, and then, then, then I'll send a lightning bolt out, and it'll plop out. No, that ain't what God said. He said, I created man in my own image. When he created Adam, he saw he was alone, and said, mm, it's not good for man to be alone. And God fixed that. God created a woman, took woman from his womb, took a, a, a rib from man and, and created... Well, do you all know why God took a rib uh, from Adam, created a woman? Because we're supposed to hold her in tight. We're supposed to be one. When you bring that woman in close to you and bring her in, into your bosom, then you become one. Uh, it, it, that, that, he, he, he took uh, the rib from our womb to bring her back in. So when... Uh, we as Christians believe that God uh, has a person out there for each of us. Yeah. And we have to wait on that person. We have to wait on that right one. And God will make it clear. When, when, you, when you are without that person, uh, God will make it clear in your heart that you need that person. Not to make you whole, but to, to be good together. Okay? God, uh, to make you whole, you need Jesus Christ. Amen. When you are when you have Jesus in your life, Jesus in your heart, and you are a Christian, then you are whole. Amen. But when, when, when God brings that one person to you, you, God will let you know. You don't have to force it. You don't have to make it happen. It just happens. Now, I do have a story that goes with that. Adam, this is God speaking. Adam, I've got just the woman for you. She will never complain or nag you. She'll be a perfect cook. She'll always look great. She'll adore you and follow any instructions you give her. Adam says, oh, God, that sounds good. How much is this going to cost me, though? God said, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. But she'll be worth it. Adam says, I don't know. What can you give me for a rib? I'm sorry, ladies. Hey, that just shows the bad choices that us men make, right? I had to say that Misty was not here today, so I could get away with that. As long as she doesn't watch the video, then we'll be good. Ladies, please don't call. <laughs> I'll be dead meat. <clears throat> anyway, uh, James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. God created Adam. God created Eve and made each one perfect. Because he created, he created them in His own image. God is good. Yes. Things may not look too good in your world right now. You think uh, for things to be good, there must be the absence of problems or pain. Not necessarily. When you hear someone say, God is good, you may want to argue. Well, you know, my back hurts and I got bills and my, my, my truck broke and my, uh, uh, and my dog died. And, 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 and you think... But God is still good. And you say, well, let's, let's talk about all these terrorist attacks and all these people that had to senselessly die. And, and, and if God was so good and He was a loving God, then He would not allow this to happen. Wrong. God.
God loves each and every person. He yes. loves even the terrorists. Amen. And if the terrorists would just understand that God is love, and they would live for God, not Allah, not some fake God, not some false God, not some demon God, sat satanic God, but if they would live for the one true God, the real God, the living God, we wouldn't have all of this. Questions always said, if God is so good, why do bad things happen? Now, we must look at the parable again. The bad things that happened in the vineyard were not caused by the owner. They were caused by the ones living, taking care of the vineyard. The tenants messed up a good thing. That's what has happened in our world today. Let's just take a look at this. A man uh, uh, built a house, built it perfectly, and, and, and he's going to rent it out. He's going to try to make a little bit of money, put a little money back, nest egg, and he rents it out. It's beautiful, brand spanking new. Uh, uh, the, all the electricity is good. It's a, the uh, heating and air is just perfect, perfectly insulated. Bright, clean walls, freshly painted, uh, brand new hardwood floors. And, and he, he invites these people in and says, okay, uh, this is the price. Do you agree to it? Yes. Okay, all I ask is that you put a deposit down. That way, you know, if things do happen, it'll cover the deposit. And they say, oh, no, 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 we're going to take care of this beautiful house. Well, over time, they have dogs in to scratch the floors and kids that tear up the walls and, and the mom and dad get into a fight and they tear up the house. And, and, you know, over 15, 20 years, the heat and the air goes out, but they don't get that fixed properly and the house just deteriorates. Now, who's to blame for this? The person that built the house, the owner of the house? The, the lease E? No. Uh, no, he built it up perfect. He built it up right. It's the tenants, the ones that took over, the ones that, that he lend to and said, eh, that's us. That's, that's us. We, we as a fallen mankind have ruined this world. Have mm -hmm. Now, it's the, I know you're saying, well, Pastor, you're contradicting what you said. Well, it's the sin in our lives that has ruined this world. Because at the very beginning, there was no sin. Mankind brought sin into this world. When Adam ate of that apple, of that fruit that Satan gave, he brought sin into this world. And it's gotten worse, and it's gotten worse, and it's gotten worse ever since. When my grandparents were children, you never would have thought about homosexuals coming out into the open. You would have never thought about women uh, walking around in, 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 in a stream. Uh, you would never have thought about a man uh, uh, raping a woman, a man uh, raping a child. You never would have thought about a, a man leaving his family uh, 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 just because he got tired of being a dad or a husband. And these things would not have happened. But over time, uh, because of sin in the world and, and the, the, the lack of uh, acknowledging this sin, because we've gotten so desensitized to sin. Yes. You know, if I if, when I first work, started working out here at Yokohama, my hands were rough, okay, because of uh, working with my hands all the time, but they weren't Yokohama rough. Uh, I, I grabbed those belts and realized that those things hurt. It's got steel, uh, little, little, like little pins sticking out the side. And, and so over time, my fingers have become desensitized mm -hmm. to being pricked by those steel, that steel and those belts. But a new person coming in, a person, a baby, just take it for instance, a baby, doesn't know sin. Now, born into the world as a sinner, but doesn't know sin, doesn't know how, doesn't know anger, doesn't know lying, doesn't know cheating, doesn't know fighting, doesn't know any of that. But they are taught all of that because of the world that we live in, mm -hmm. because of families, because of schools, because of TV, because of video games, because of friends, because of whatever the case is, we're taught this. And unless they are taught about Christ, unless they are taught to serve Christ, unless they are taught to obey, uh, to be obedient to God's Word, then they will, they will become desensitized to sin. And then they will think it's just, well, that's just the way it is. Uh, uh, the tenants messed up a thing. Uh, messed up a good thing. That's what's happened to our world. We live in a fallen world. When someone complains that life isn't fair, it's best sometimes to say, you're right, life isn't fair. But God is good. Amen. God is good. Amen. And it's more than a saying that we say God really is good. And He's good all the time. Amen. Now, 
You don't know how good God is until you have become a Christian, until you can understand the blessings that He gives us. And, it, and for, Take this, for instance, an example. There's a new diner. It's been down there for about a year now, I guess, uh, in Troutville. They sell great barbecue. Just the food is just phenomenal. It's awesome. But unless you've been there and have bought it and tasted it, you don't know for sure. You may take someone else's word for it. Yeah, that barbecue is really good, but you don't know for a fact that it's really good until you have tasted it. Until you have become a Christian, until you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't know how good God is Amen. until you have tasted and seen. Now, when you experience the living God of the Bible, not a religion, okay? I'm not talking about religion here. When you experience the living God of the Bible, you'll say like Andy Griffith used to say, mm -mm, good. <laughs> Number two, God is patient. He sends us many messengers. In the parable, the owner who represents God sent a servant to the vineyard when the grapes were ready to harvest. The tenants were like sharecroppers. The owner didn't demand all the grapes, just a portion of them. His part that they had agreed to. But the tenants rejected the servant and beat him up, kicked him out. The essence of sin is declaring independence from your Creator. Refusing to acknowledge God's ownership of this world and over your life and rejecting His claim over your life. Sin is always first an attitude that says, I don't need God. I'm the master of my faith and the captain, captain of my soul. These tenants insulted the owner by rejecting his servant. Now these servants, let's think about the, uh, the Old Testament, Testament prophets. What would you do if you were the landlord of a rental house and you sent an employee to collect the rent and instead of it paying, the renter beat up your employee. God would have been legally and morally justified to instantly reclaim the vineyard from sinful mankind and punish us immediately. But He didn't. He didn't. He's long-suffering. He's patient. Amen. But at this point in this parable, we learn the shocking truth that God is not only good, He is patient. In the Old Testament, as I just said, God sent many prophets to Israel to warn them of the dangers of rejecting God. Most of the prophets were abused and scorned when they were alive. Think about Elijah, who was threatened by wicked queen Jezebel. Jeremiah was thrown into a pit to die. Amos was scorned and ridiculed. Think of Moses when he was leading the people out of Israel. They went out of, I mean, out of Egypt. They went out of Egypt, what, a whole day? And they were saying it would have been better that we would have died in Egypt than to, to die right here before they crossed the Nile River? I mean, they, they, the whole time they, they, they scorned Moses and said, why did you bring us out here to die? When he was just being obedient to God. And he was trying to teach the people to, to obey God and not reject God. The messages of the prophets were never valued until years after they died. Someone said, someone once said, prophets and poet, uh, prophets, poets, and pigs have one thing in common. They aren't truly appreciated until they're dead. God owns this world and He owns your life. Have you rejected His claim? If you have, you should be thankful God is patient. If you sit here today and you say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, is He Lord over your life? Or do you reject Him when He tells you, no, you shouldn't do that? Or, you know, you ought to do this. He keeps on sending messengers to patiently request you to, to surrender to Him what is rightfully Amen. His. Yes. God has promised He will punish sin. He will punish disobedience. You may think you're getting away with your sin. No. God is just being patient with you. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some men count slackness, but as long-suffering to us were, not willing that anyone should perish, yes. but that all should come to repentance. Amen. That's 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. Number 3. God is loving. He sent His only Son. What is God like? He is good. He is patient. But you know what the shocking truth about God is? He is loving. In the parable, after his servants had been rejected and abused, he takes an unprecedented, astonishing step. He 
He sent His Son. Jesus called Him the Beloved Son. In, Mark's, uh, in the book of Mark, this, uh, the owner sends His only Son. The words Beloved Son are the same words heard when Jesus was baptized. A voice from heaven said, This is my Beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, I was reading my Bible the other day, and I come across an amazing verse. You all know it. But as I was reading it, as I was meditating on this message, and as I was reading the verse, it, it's probably the most important statement about God found in the Bible. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. Can you understand that? Can you comprehend that God gave His Son to die? He loves us so much that He sent His Son, and because His Son was so obedient to the Father, He went all the way even to death. There's only one God, and He has only one Son who loves us so much. So what do we do? We run out and we, and we greet Him and meet Him and, and fall at His feet and, and surrender? No. Like the tenants of the parable, we crucify the Son of God. We disobey in not giving back to Him that what it, which is His. Not being obedient and honoring Him with our lives through our actions and our words. In our conversation, we're sinning against the loving God. This parable not only highlights the shocking truth about the character of God, it reveals the shocking truth about the utter wickedness of the human heart. The tenants of the vineyard didn't kill the owner's son in spontane spontane spontaneous <laughs> heat of emotion. They made a calculated decision. They thought about killing the son so they could claim ownership to the vineyard. That's what's so amazing about God's love. I am a sinner by nature, by choice, but God still loves me in spite of my sin. Yes. The owner of the vineyard was good. He was patient. He was loving. But he couldn't allow the wickedness of the tenants to go unnoticed or unpunished. Final shocking truth about God, number four. God is holy. He will punish sin. After Jesus spoke of the tenants killing the owner's son, He paused and asked, what will the uh, owner of the vineyard do then? Before the listeners had a chance to respond, He answered His own question. He said, He will come, He will kill them, and He will give the vineyard to someone else. Don't confuse God's love with Syrupy sentimentality. Oh, he loves us so much. No. He is holy. He cannot, will not tolerate sin. Some people think God is like some half witted, permissive substitute teacher who looks at the world of misbehaving sinners and says, Now, 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 boys and girls, please sit down and be quiet. No. God is holy. He's long suffering. He's patient. He's loving, but He is holy. He's like the owner of the vineyard. There will be a day of judgment for those who reject the Son. In the book of Revelation, we're learning about in, in Sunday school class, there's a great deal written about God's ultimate judgment against those who reject His love. In the middle of these future judgment, an angel says to God, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because Thou hast judged Thus, Revelation 16, verse 5. Because God is holy, He will punish sin. Because He is holy, is right, he, he is right and just in His judgments. What is true of the nation of Israel historically is true of us personally. God sent prophets and angels to Israel and finally He sent His Son. Because of the nation of Israel rejected God's Son, they suffered the consequence of losing the vineyard. For almost 1,900 years, Israel passed out of existence. And only since 1948 
had they become a nation again. Jesus infuriated the Jewish leaders because He claimed to be the stone which the builders rejected. This is the reference. Uh, according to 1 Kings chapter 6, it took 30,000 workmen over seven years to complete the temple. All the stones were quarried away from the building site so there was no sound of hammering heard there. Jewish tradition says one day the building superintendent saw an unusual stone being delivered. Because it was cut in an odd shape, he thought it was flawed. He had it rolled away into the Kidron Valley, where it lay untouched and unnoticed. Years later, the builder sent word to the quarry that he was ready for the main cornerstone. The quarry master came and reported, Why, I had that stone delivered years ago. When they began to search, they discovered that the discarded stone in the valley was the main cornerstone. It was covered with debris and moss. It took many men working hard to raise the massive stone out of the valley. When they raised it and set it, it fit perfectly. The chief's cornerstone was the very rock they rejected. Jesus is that rock. The Jews were on the verge of rejecting God's chief cornerstone. They would crucify Him, but God was going to exalt Jesus by raising Him from the dead. A few months after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, Peter and John were arrested for healing a paralyzed man. They were summoned before the same Jewish council who sentenced Jesus to die. Instead of pleading for mercy, Peter used the opportunity to repeat these words. Acts chapter 4, 10 through 12. Know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to, uh, among men by which we must be saved. I ask you today, have you made God your Lord and Savior? Have you made Jesus your Lord and Savior? I look at it and I say, I'd say everyone here is saved. I hope you are. I don't know for sure. Only you and God know for sure whether or not you have asked Him a specific time, a specific place, you ask God to save.